start recording. Good. All right, so welcome everyone to the fifth lecture, uh, which means that we are one third of the way through um, of bioinformatics for plant and animal sciences. Um, the stream will start soon. No, we started streaming. Um, so for today, I made a basic R introduction for you guys um, so that you guys, when next time we have R in the assignments, you you can be better prepared and um, well enjoy it more because programming is an enjoyable experience I think. Um, Alright so the overview of today is um, using R as a basic calculator, um, the different types and the type system in R. Uh, one of the things which will screw you up is the type system in R. R has many different types and it auto converts from one type to the other type and um, I've been programming in R now for I think like 14 years or something um, since my master it's it's that long ago that I did my master I'm getting old um, but um, the type system is really difficult and because of the auto conversions going on it it just it, it will screw you over many many times and even if you think that you're capable of handling it you just get screwed over even more so 10 years 10 years since my master but I started at the beginning of my master, so that, that means that I've been programming in R for like 12 years or something. So it doesn't matter. So we will talk about types, about indexing, about variables, um, how to make scripts, um, clean coding, one of my pet peeves, because clean coding is something that really makes coding better. Uh, we will talk about control structures and escaping. So it's more or less the first two lectures or the first three lectures of the normal R course uh, fused into one. So we have to get a move on and, and really um, start doing it. Um, but first um, I want to go to the uh, previous, uh, previous assignments. Um, so let's go to Notepad++ and let me open it up for you guys and then show you the thing as well. All right, so these are my answers. Um, I will put them on Moodle, of course. Um, the thing is, is the way that I start is I always start doing something like this. So I have like a couple of hashtags, which are, uh, so these are comment characters in R. And then I just say answers to the assignments of lecture four. And the guy who made it is me. Um, normally you would put in a copyright statement as well. But since these are assignments, there's no real need for copyright statements. Um, so uh, my R scripts always start with a set working directory at the top because you need to move to where you stored your folder. Um, so in this case it is on my D drive in a folder called D drive um, then in projects, lectures, bioinformatics and animal breedings and I'm still loading the old data set from the 2016-2017 course and then I have a folder called assignments in that. Um, so the first, uh, first rule or the first line after that is loading in the data generally um, unless we have to load some packages but um, loading packages comes later um, because there wasn't a separate assignment for that. Um, so the first one is to just load in the microarray data and then um, I use the dim function which stands for dimension to get the dimensions of the microarray. Um, it's always good to ask for the dimensions after loading it in um, so you know that it loaded in the whole data set. Sometimes you load in a data set which you know has like 20,000 um, rows, yeah, so 20,000 lines in there. And then when you ask for the dimension, it only gives you like 400 or 500. So then it stopped loading halfway through. Um, that sometimes happens in R, especially if you have like a comment character, like a hashtag somewhere in your data set. Um, it might break based on the hashtag. Um, or there might be a hidden character like a slash zero or some Mac OS X or Linux character in there which will break the loading of the data set. So the first things that I do when I load in a data set is always ask for the dimensions um, and in this case um, also the assignment asks you to do the dimensions right um, because um, we wanted to know how many samples there were so how many columns there are in the file and how many mRNAs have been measured um, using how many probes. Alright so let's open up the R window for you guys um, and show you guys the R window and then don't do the notepad window. So let's start by setting the worker ring directory, loading in the microarray data and then it tells me that there are 
So the first one is always the rows, and these are the columns. You can have multidimensional matrices as well in R, so we could have like four, five, or six dimensions. Um, but um, in this case, we only have two dimensions, so it's really a matrix. Um, and well, the answer to 1A is that there are six columns in our file, so six different samples, and there are 22,283 rows, meaning that on the microarray that we are that we use, there are 22,283 probes. Could be more. Um, sometimes the same probe is on a microarray a couple of times, and I think also this data set is filtered for the standard control probes. You always have a control probe called dark corner and bright corner, um, and those are the negative and positive controls. So um, they might still be in here, they might be removed. Um, but there's generally a lot of kind of control probes in there. Um, all right, so then the next uh, exercise was to uh, make a little bit of a box plot and then um, I will make the window a little bit smaller so that we have room for the box plot. Um, so the code was actually in the assignment. Um, so um, someone had a problem with that, right? Testosaurus, was you the one that got invalid argument for the box plot? I think so. Um, so, but the box plot should be relatively straightforward. Um, so, this is how it looks when I do it. Um, so I have LES um, and then I have CEX.axis uh, equals 0 0.7. Um, so this is the magnification of the axis. Um, so you can see that here everything fits. And then you have LES equals 2 and LES equals 2 rotates the stuff. Um, so did you use the exact same code or did you use something else. It might be, did you copy the code from the Word document? Um, let me try that. Let me open up the Word document and copy paste in the code from the Word document. No, I don't get an invalid argument then either. So, I don't, I don't know. Um, do you still have the code that produced it? Because there shouldn't be any errors there. Um, so the, the next two questions were to figure out what these two parameters do. Um, copy it from the assignment. Uh, I'm copying it from the Word file. I, I, you can't see that, of course, but um, when I copy it from the Word file, then it still works perfectly fine. Wait a second. I'm looking at the Word document. I gave you guys the PDF. Um, let me open up the PDF and copy it from there. Document docx bioinformatics uh, assignment for PDF. It might be that there's like a hidden PDF character thingy in there. Um, so let me select this and then copy it and then paste it in. No, it still looks exactly the same. Are you using Windows or are you using another? Um, because PDFs actually can um, Windows. So let me see if I, I if I copy an additional like 2a or something. No, no I, I don't get that error. Um, normally you would get an invalid error if you if you type things in wrong, but even then it would just not it would not do anything. It won't give you an error. So I'm really wondering what's going on there. Um, was it the first box plot or one of the other box plots that you have to make? That's weird. It's really weird. Um, dim microarray was also 362 in mine. Ah, okay. So then something got messed up um, when you downloaded it or when you loaded it in. Hmm. Well, try again, I would say. And uh, the, the, there should be 22,800. So it might be that when you downloaded it, the file got corrupted, the microarray file. And of course, when the microarray file is corrupted, it might mean that there's not not enough um, space there. Uh, so that, that it kind of stops loading halfway through. Um, but yeah. Um, so if we do the uh, if we put the cx dot axis to 0 0.1 right, uh, we can see that the, the the axis here becomes smaller. 
right? So uh, if if for question two uh, two b it was make the box plot with and without specifying the cx that axis, what does the axis do? Um, so the thing that it does is make the make the axis magnification bigger or smaller. Um, so you can put it to two, and then it will become like really big. Um, you can put it to one, which is the default, um, and you can put it to zero point seven, like I did in this case, to to show the entire uh, thing. Um, so the LAS uh, turns the um, turns the axis. So you can see that when I do it with LAS equals one, it's like this. Um, when I do it with LAS equals two, it, it flips the axis around. So it, it just rotates it 90 degrees. All right, so then before we start, we need to log transform the data um, because when you look at the data here, you can see that the distribution is really weird, right? So you have a lot of values which are very close to zero um, and that's why you see the box plot and then you have a massive amount of outliers on the top. So the outliers on the top go up to 100,000 plus. Um, and that is of course because this is intensity value. So they are um, lumen or the amount of um, the amount of intensity that you get. Um, so light intensity doesn't really follow a normal distribution. Um, it's more like a, a Poisson distribution. Um, so before we can do anything with the microarray data, we have to log through transform it. Um, so you do that um, by using the apply function. So I will show you the answers again. So let me show you the notepad plus plus window. So that is of course, um, the uh, next assignment. I have to move to the R win R to the Notepad plus plus window as well. So here you see the uh, so here's the uh, LAS orientation of the axis. Cx dot axis is the size of the axis, um, and then we want to uh, log to transform. Um, so what we do here is we use the apply function. So the apply function is kind of a for loop. Um, so in this case we apply to our microarray data set. Then we have two. Um, which is to the columns, not to the rows. So one is rows, two is, is columns in this case, uh, the log to function. So we're just going to take the data set and log to transform it. Um, so when we go to R and we do that and we make a new box plot, so let me copy the box plot code as well. Um, and then we go to the R window. So when we do that, we now see that we have a, we have a different distribution, right? So now we can see that the, the box plot looks a lot more um, normally distributed. So you see that most of the arrays, the uh, the median of the arrays is around 10, sometimes a little bit lower, sometimes a little bit higher. Um, and you see that the range now has changed, so some values are actually below zero, um, which which is bad. But what we what you can see here is that the range is around like from like 0 0.5 all the way up to like 16. Um, but hey, if we would look at a single one of these, so instead of looking at a box plot, we could do a histogram. Um, so we we could do that, right? So say histogram, microarray, log, and we just take the first microarray. Um, then we see now that this looks more or less like a like a normal distribution, a, a lot more like a normal distribution than the raw data looks. Um, and of course, we want to do that um, because of the fact that most statistics that we want to do in the end are uh, parametric statistics. So we want to use things like t-tests. And of course, for a t-test, I need to have a normal distribution. So, all right. So, what happens when you do microarray log microarray one log two? Uh, the same, because taking the log two value doesn't really depend. the The thing is, is that it just will uh, change the ordering. I think, um, because if I go across the rows, right? So I do it. This is uh, this is via the columns. So now, if I ask the dimensions of the microarray log variable, then you see that it's still 2,228 rows and six columns. Um, if I would do the same thing, but go via the rows, um, if I now ask for the dimensions, you see that it flipped it around. So now the thing which used to be in the rows is now in the columns, and the stuff that used to be in the columns is now in the rows. So if I want now try to make a box plot, then that would crash R because then I'm trying to make 22,000 box plots um, and that will just not be possible. It will not be able to fit on the screen. Um, so you will get a whole bunch of little box plots. Um, but the thing is, is that if you go by the rows or by the columns, um, the values don't change because uh, taking the log two of the value 10,000 will always be the same value. No matter if you iterate through rows or two columns, um, it will just be the exact same value. Um, 
but when you do it by the rows, it actually flips them around. So it, the, the columns become the rows and the rows become the columns. Um, of course, you can easily fix this um, because you can just have the transpose function deal with you. Um, so the transpose function is in the rest of the lecture. So if you want to transpose it, then again, it takes the matrix and flips it on its side. Um, and now we have 22,000 rows again and six columns. So, but that's the difference, um, Jan. The difference is that um, it will flip it around. All right, but now we know that the distribution looks a lot better, right? So, and of course, I just asked you guys to look at the uh, look at the uh, box plot. Um, wait, I have to first um, do it like this so that it's in the right dimension, and then I can just make a box plot. And now you see that hey, all of the distributions look more or less similar. Um, you see that the first two arrays have more outliers than the rest of the arrays, so they have some outliers on the top, some outliers on the bottom, um, and the other arrays don't really seem to have that. You also see that the variance um, around the median is less in the first two box plots. The other box plots have a little bit more variance, so they are slightly differently scaled. Alright, so then the next step would be is because of course we and this could just be due to the fact that some of these microarrays have been done on different days. Um, because you don't run all the microarrays on the same day, you actually should, but in the case of having a microarray company or a company that does microarrays, they, they could spread it out over several days. Um, so every day has its own little variance, right? So um, there could be that the temperature is a little bit higher, the, the, the humidity in the air is a little bit different. Um, so that means that um, um, f on a day-to-day -day basis, you have some variance in scanning a, the same box, uh, the same microarray. So if you take the same microarray, scan it on day one, then scan it on day ten, uh, then the values would be shifted a little bit um, because of the environmental conditions. So one of the things that we want to do is get rid of that, and for that we can use this preprocess core package uh, to normalize the quantiles. Um, so if we'll first load the library, so it's just loading library preprocess core. I think I already installed it, so that should not be an issue. Um, the code to install the package was also in the assignment, so I hope that everyone that that works for everyone. Sometimes if you have a very old version of R, um, you can't install this package, um, but then you just have to update your R version. Um, and then, of course, we, we take the uh, microarray log. Oh, let me show you the Notepad++ again. So, hey, of course, what we then do is we take the microarray log variable, so the, the log to transform data, and then we normalize the quantiles. I think there was a little error in the assignment, um, because the assignment said that you should do it on the microarray data. And of course, doing it on the microarray data doesn't really work. Um, so there was a little bit of an error in that assignment. So um, I'm sorry for that. Um, I try to redo most of the assignments every year to make sure that all of the errors are out there. I made a note. I think someone also mailed me, so thank you for that. Um, so I made a note, and in the next version of the assignments, the error will be fixed. Um, so normalize quantiles on the microarray log data and then um, the thing is in R we have to put back the column names and the row names because the normalize quantile function if we would just look at the microarray log right um, and we would just look at the first five rows and then the first five columns um, it looks like this so you see here the, the measurement values oh sorry you're not seeing the R window so if you would index it right because it's a matrix you can just use the square brackets and I'm asking show me the first five rows, show me the first five columns um, and then it gives you this like little matrix um, but then you can see that here are the measurement values and you see here the names of the of the samples and then here you see the different probes so the probes have names like 1007 underscore s underscore at um, which actually means that this probe is originally an Arabidopsis thaliana probe um, which is um, a plant, uh, model plant. Um, but uh, when we do the uh, normalized quantiles function, um, it will not copy the row names and the column names onto the new variable that you assign it to. Um, you could, um, but normally it doesn't. Um, sometimes it does. But um, I always put them back originally, so I just take the column names and the row names from the previous variable and then put these on the microarray log Q norm, um, so quantile normalized data. All right, so let's put this in R and then make a new box plot and see what happens. Um, so um, 
let me show you the R window so that you're they are live. So now what you see what it did actually is it now it now made the median of each box plot the same because now every every box plot has the same median. Um, this, the, the difference in variance in the different box plot has also been standardized um, and you can see now that also the it has the same amount of outliers on the bottom um, and there are no outliers on the top. But what this function just does, it just says that, well, go through each of the microarrays and make sure that every microarray has the same average value, kind of, and the same variance. Um, so hey, it removes this day-to-day -day variance. Um, it doesn't know exactly what it removes. It just takes the names of the, or it just takes the microarrays and it just shifts the microarray so that they all have the same median. So what it does, it, it's, it calculates the overall median um, and then just divides every number or it, it just subtracts the difference from the microarray medium to the overall median um, and then it standardizes this stuff by um, calculating the overall standard deviation and then uh, dividing um, every value. So it just takes the values and, and shifts them around every bit. Um, of course values which used to be low on microarray 1 are still low on microarray 1. So if I would um, for example plot the values of the microarray uh, log values right against and take the first microarray so the first sample and I would plot those against the microarray log q norm first microarray um, then you would see um, a relatively straight line right so it just took the values and moved them a little bit so you can see that values that used to be five in the old array are now lower than lower than five so they had it just took the data pulled it down a little bit and you see that there's a little it's not a straight line um, but you can see that uh, the, the a value which used to be low is still low a value which used to be high is still high so the ordering of the array so the ordering of the probes didn't change so um, that's kind of what it does all right so the answer to what do we see now is we see that the range of the data is similar for all samples so all samples now have the same median value, they have the same variance, um, so you can compare microarray to microarray. And if you don't normalize them, does it do it by probe? Uh, kind of. Um, it, so it calculates the overall mean of the um, data, it calculates the overall standard deviation of the data, um, it does the same thing for each of the arrays individually and then it starts um, by going, taking the distribution and then just doing a, a transformation on the distribution. So it just says the difference between the two medians, um, subtract that from every probe. Right, so then every probes get pulled down or it gets pushed up, um, and then the standard deviation works the same, um, but that's a little bit of a more difficult transformation because every value needs to be adjusted a little bit. But in the end, it it does it for each of the probes on the array. So every probe on the array gets touched; it gets changed based on how far it is away from the the current array that you are looking at and the global median. Um, so that's kind of what it does. And in the end, of course, you look, you have a picture where you just see, okay, so all of the arrays now have the same median. Um, so this will kind of remove any um, any effects, for example, if you would put too little DNA on the array, right? Because if you put less DNA on one of the arrays than on the other array, then of course the array with more DNA on there will just have higher intensity values. And this has nothing to do with biology, Just this just has to do with you not being good at pipetting. So putting like different amount, and that, that always happens. You can have the exact same amount of DNA no matter how well you are in pipetting. All right, so um, let me look at the assignments. So that's the normalization. Um, there are many other different ways of normalizing. So um, you could normalize it yourself, um, but um, this is the easiest way to do it. All right, so what is the major difference between this box plot and the one from question 3a? Well, this one is normalized. Um, it has most of the variance or the differences in variance are removed and the differences in the median of the arrays are removed as well. All right, and then I want to do just one of the uh, additional questions. So the additional question was to do a little bit of clustering um, and, and I just gave you the code for that. So I just wanted to show you how the results should look. 
um, so um, all of the additional so what what you see here is when we do a clustering um, and we do it uh, what we do is we, we ask it to make a distance matrix um, we have to transpose the matrix so we go from rows being columns to columns being rows um, um, and then we calculate the distance matrix so the distance matrix is then calculated for each row against each other row and then we do haklist which is a uh, which is a clustering algorithm which then using the distance makes a clustering and then we can plot the different clusters so what you can see from the data here is that there are four samples which are relatively similar right so they are relatively equal to each other and then there are two samples here which are also relatively equal to each other but different from the other four so looking at the data here um, it seems that there are more or less two major groups in our data uh, one group containing two microarrays and the other group containing around four microarrays um, so that's kind of what this tree um, shows you and then there was the scale variation um, uh, so finding the highly variable probes um, I think I left that question in right so the scaled variation since we can't really do any t-tests right because we have um, well, we have a group of two individuals versus a group of th four individuals. And for a t-test, you need at, min at, a, at least three, in three individuals in each of the group. Um, so three versus three is the minimum sample size that you need for a t-test. Um, but you can still look at the scaled variation. Um, so that means um, that you use um, the scale, uh, you, you apply to the microarrays to one to the rows a function of x and then you look at the the variance of x divided by the mean of x right so if something has a high variance and a high mean um, then this is weight less than if you have a high variance and a low mean so you just look at the ratio between the variance of the data and the mean of the data so you get stuff which is highly um, variable um, so if we do that, and we do that in R by just copy pasting in the code that I gave you guys, then hey, you will get this scaled variation, um, which is just a vector. Um, let's look at the first 10. So for each of the probes, it will tell you what the ratio between the variance and the mean is. So for example, for the first probe, it's 0 0.006. Um, for the next probe, it's 0 0.009, and so on. And of course, like the variance is always, or generally much, um, uh, much smaller than the than the mean of the uh, of the array um, if we would plot this of course then this would look like this I think I can still plot that it's only 120,000 points and so you see here that that uh, across the different probes on the array we see kind of a wavy pattern um, I don't know exactly why um, but hey, you see that there are some probes which are relatively having a high variance compared to their average value on the array um, and of course we can then take these and make a nice box plot of these and so we can say which ones are the ones which are highly variable so what we do is we take um, we ask R take the scaled variation vector look which ones are above one um, ask which ones those are and then just take the names of those and those are the probes which we call highly variable um, so if we then look at highly variable then this will just contain probe names um, that are above the one line so we just draw a straight line here through the data and we say everything which is higher than one is an interesting gene because it is it is variable in our data set and then of course we can make a nice heat map um, to kind of look um, so when we do that then we see that it looks more or less like this um, so again we can see the same structure in the samples on the top we see that there are two samples which are very similar and then we see that there are four samples which are very similar to each other but different from the other two and then here you see the probes um, and you see then the expression of the probes in the in across these and so you see here that there's a group of 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 probes which is high in um, the two samples here and which is low in the other four samples and then of course here we see the same thing but it, it's less high in the second one but it's still if you look at these like four it four to six it seems that they are high in this sample and low in the other sample so had that it's you can't really do statistics because it's only six samples and you can't do a t-test because of the way that they group um, but you still get a little bit of an idea um, so then you could look at which genes are these probes targeting and then you would take the names of the genes and then look to see if there's anything known about why these genes might be very different between the, the samples that you put on 
All right, so create and look at the heat map. What is the thing we can learn from this? So my answer to this is uh, we observed the groups we saw before. However, now in the second group, there's a typo in there, so let's fix it. Now in the second group, we see that there are again two groups. Um, we learn which probes and genes on the microarray show a difference between our samples. So that was the um, idea. So just that, just a little bit of basic R um, so that you could, guys could, uh, could look at it. Um, I think I, there's also a question about the um, about the st structure prediction. Um, so I didn't do the structure prediction. I hope that everyone was able to do that. Um, if you were not, then let me know. Um, if you want me to do it for you guys, then I could do that. It's just that it takes a long time. Um, the RNA molecule, which codes for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, is relatively big. Um, so I, when I did it at home, I had to wait like five minutes for the website to do the uh, to do the structure. But uh, I think it's relatively simple, right? It's just using the RNA fold web server and just putting in the um, the code that you found. But if anyone has issues with it, then we can do that. But I would really like to start with the uh, with the assignments um, or no, with the lecture. Uh, we're done with the assignment. So I really wanted to start with, uh, with the lecture because um, the lecture um, is long and there's a lot of R that we have to go through. All right, so those were the solutions, or at least my solutions. I will put them online um, and um, testosaurus, um, uh, do check what, what's wrong. Um, and if you can't figure it out, then um, send me an email and we can schedule a date to um, kind of remote desktop in. Um, what I would advise you first is to try to re-download the data set. It might be that um, when you downloaded the data set something went wrong um, and it got cut halfway through. Um, it, it happens sometimes. Sending stuff over the internet has a... And there's no error checking or not a lot of error checking so could be that that's the thing that uh, that's doing that. All right, so R as a calculator. Um, I think that most people know that R, you can just use it as a calculator. Um, so if you will just type in stuff, then it will give you the answer. So hey, if I type in 1 plus 4, it will give me 5. If I do 5 divided by 10, it will give me 0 0.5. Um, there are some special operators. So if you want to calculate the exponent, so 5 to the power of 2, you have to use this um, this this roof symbol, or you can just use x x or the, just the, the multi multiply multiply operator. So it, 2 times multiply means to the power of. So this is 5 to the power of 2, and this is also 5 to the power of 2. Um, just remember that the decimal separator in R is always the period, never the comma. Um, and that is something that goes wrong in some countries um, which um, don't use the decimal separator to be. Like in, in American system, you usually use the comma um, for separating thousands and a dot for separating the uh, decimals. Um, in Germany it's usually the other way around so you use the dot for thousands or space for thousands and a comma for uh, the, the decimal separator. Um, but it's never, in R it's always a dot. So if five, uh, 0 0.5 is half, 0, 0,5 is just an error. Um, and you will run into that sometimes because if you get an Excel file from someone from Zimbabwe, for example, it might be that he is encoding his numbers with commas. Um, so then you have to recode it um, using a more sane system. Um, there are some special numerical constants in R like E and F for infinite, NAN, uh, NAN for not a number, and NA for a missing value. So values are allowed to be missing. Uh, missing values propagate. So if you calculate the mean of a, of a set of values which contains a missing value, then the, the, the mean will also be missing. You can get around that um, by using na.omit um, or rm.na equals true, um, but NAs propagate. And there's a good number why NAs propagate, because in theory when you, when you really have a missing value, right, then the mean is undefined. So it's, it's not 
you don't know what the what the mean is so if there's if you have 10 measurements and one of them is missing then you don't know what the mean is so that's why the NAs propagate about the Euclidean division and the Euclidean division remainder I always show um, a single slide or two slides actually um, which kind of explain this and Euclidean division and the Euclidean division remainder are very useful in programming especially when you start writing your own loops and doing multi-core programming to kind of put stuff on different CPU cores if you have a multi-core CPU um, so then you use Euclidean division a lot and also the Euclidean remainder um, so the way that it works is it's similar to normal division um, so when I learned how to divide stuff in school uh, they taught us to do it like this so if I want to divide 100 by 39 I put 100 in the middle and 39 on the side and then I have these um, these these kind of brackets here and then uh, the first thing that I do is I try to fit these this number into this number um, uh, by blanking out the, the, the last zero right so um, can I divide 10 by 39 no I cannot so then I have to add a zero so hey, this teaches me um, that the answer will be one number less than 39 so it will not be above 10 um, that's not that important but hey, what we see is if we have 39 by 100 then we can put 39 twice in 100 and then hey, we have uh, 78 and then hey, this will look like this so and normally you would then start continuing the computation so you would then put a comma here put a new zero here pull the zero down and then look how often three th uh, 39 would put into 220 and then you would just continue this until there was no division remainder but then you would get not a uh, you would get not a an integer number you would get a floating point number so you would get two point something um, in the end but here for this example um, had the Euclidean divisor in this case is 2 because 39 fits twice in a hundred wholly and then after that you have 22 remaining and this is the Euclidean division remainder so in this case we're not doing the nonsense by putting another zero here pulling it down and then continuing with fractionals no we just look to see how often 39 fits into a th uh, fits into uh, 100 so that's twice so hey, you can divide 100 by 39 two times so you can take out 39 two times and after you've taken it out two times there are 22 left um, and so what does this relate to multi-core programming well in multi-core programming this would mean that if I would have a hundred items that I need to calculate and I would batch them out into 39 elements together then I could use two computer cores right two computer cores are full so doing 39 elements and then I need a third computer core which would do 22 elements um, and then I could do all of them in one go or I could do all of them in parallel on a multi-core computer this is not that useful yet but uh, just be aware that R has special functions so it has the Euclidean division which is percent slash percent and it has Euclidean division remainder which is percent percent um, so you, it, it will come up sometimes all right of course R has a whole bunch of other things which are built in so there's a whole bunch of built-in constants like letters uh, written uppercase um, and those are just the 26 uppercase letters of the Roman alphabet so this is just a vector which you can use to select from um, it also contains uh, letters small letters which or in lowercase which are the lowercase letters of the standard Roman alphabet uh, we have month.up which are the three letter abbreviations for the English months and we have month.name which are the English names for the months of the year so if you ever want to do anything with programming and you're wondering what is the seventh month then you can just do month.name um, square bracket seven square bracket close and then it will tell you the name of the seventh month um, so sometimes that's useful um, and sometimes you need to especially when you're dealing with data which is measured across the year um, another very useful built-in constant is pi um, and pi is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter um, so I think everyone knows how to calculate the surface area of a, of a circle which is 2 pi r um, uh, so that that should be okay
Uh, but it's just a built-in constant, so you don't have to multiply with 3.14, 15, and these kinds of things. No, in R you can just say 2 times pi, um, and then it will just have more or less an infinite precision on, on pi, which is better than just using 3.14. Um, R also supports imaginary numbers, so everyone who's ever wanted to calculate some spring constants like imagine that I have a weight which is suspended from a spr spring and there's a like thing with water down there and I let go of the weight which then drops into the water and goes up and down um, then you have this kind of dampening curve and this dampening curve you can only compute using imaginary numbers um, so R supports imaginary numbers um, but not by default you have to put plus zero one i and that makes so if you ask for the square root of minus one it will say this is not a number but if you ask for the square root of minus one plus zero imaginary part right so this is the same as minus one then it will now tell you that no oh, indeed the square root of minus one is i or minus i of course um, can someone ban that guy uh, let me Time out. Ban. Yeah, got him. Got him. <laughs> Very good. I like that. Like, want to buy followers? No, we're we're here to get followers the old-fashioned way. Um, so imaginary numbers are supported in R, and of course we were not going to use them soon. And in bioinformatics, I think I used imaginary numbers like three times during my entire PhD and after. Um, but sometimes you need to. So sometimes imaginary numbers can be really useful. Um, hey, my jo yeah, I know, I know, but you were you were not there, so I, I I already banned the guy. Like, I can do the ban hammer as well. So not only that, but I can also make you VIP or revoke your VIP status and stuff. Um, anyway, so R also supports basic trigonometry functions, so sine, cosine, uh, tangent. Uh, arc sine, arc cosine, and the arc tangent, um, which is really nice when you want to do trigonometry, like doing triangles and circles and, and these kinds of things. So, hey, you can just do that in R, um, and they are named by their normal name. Um, they are functions, so you have to put like round brackets, right? So, sine of 5 is you just switch out log by sine. Um, so you, you have to use the round brackets. So the log of 5 is just a natural logarithm of 5, which um, in um, in our countries, right, we would say this is the ln. Um, so the, the natural logarithm, which is e as a base. Um, so this is poorly chosen. So log 5, I always think 10 log. But 10 log is actually log 10, and then use the 5. So this is the base 10 logarithm of 5, well this is the natural logarithm of 5, so it uses the e, um, so it uses e to the power of like exp, right? So exponent 1 is e to the power of 1, uh, exponent 2 is e to the power of 2 and so on, so those are in there. Um, so e is not a building constant, exp is just a function to get the um, e number, which is 2.8 something I think. Um, so I hope that everyone paid attention in math. But all of the math is just available in R. R just is a big... F <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. R is just a big fancy uh, calculator. All right, so um, R follows the standard operator precedence. Um, so the order of operations in R is um, not left to right or right to left or the way that people normally would do it um, first um, so if you have a big sum right then first you do exponents and roots then you do multiplication and division and then you do addition and subtraction so you often see like these Facebook posts where people say what is the answer of 10 minus 3 times 2 and then well go what is the the answer to 10 minus 3 times 2 Come on, people, you can do it. Just put it in chat, don't be scared. It's just one of these Facebook tests that your aunties and uncles always try to look smart on. All right, Testosaurus says four. Are there any other answers? Or do we all agree with, with Testosaurus? Right, it's, uh, 
Like your guy, you all think that the guy named Testosaurus has the answer correctly? Or is everyone already asleep? If everyone's asleep, we're gonna have a 60 second ad break right, right now. But, uh, <laughs> let me see. Is there anyone else in chat be, be, beside Testosaurus? Yeah, not, not too many. Like, Jan is still here. Like, the, the rest of the people have already, like, uh, left. I think. Four. Ah, very good. Thank you. Skurita also thinks it's four. Alright, very nice, very nice. Sandra also four. So everyone thinks it's four. No, no one comes up with 14 being the answer. Like... <laughs> That would be under the Facebook post, right? Under the Facebook post, you would see 14, 28, like 37. We all went to school. Yeah, sure, sure. But this this apparently is very, very difficult. Um, but yeah, you first do the multiplication and then, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. Yeah, Jan, very good. No, but um, yeah, if it, it, you first do the multiplication. So 3 times 2 is 6, and then 10 minus 6 is, is 4. So, um, but hey, on... on Look through your Facebook history. Um, you see a couple of people that actually go and, and answer stuff, which is very different. Of course, the, the real answer is, of course, 4 plus 0i, which, of course, if you are dealing with imaginary numbers, is the only correct answer because you never should forget the imaginary part of the number. So 4 plus 0i is actually more correct. Anyway, so... And, um, this is the order of, uh, of precedence, so um, to remember that, I think everyone in high school learned, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, or um, in, in Dutch we have a different one. And I, I bet Germans have a different, like, donkey bridge kind of thingy uh, to, uh, to do that. Anyway, um, operator precedence, um, it's in R, um, and it will bite you sometimes if you don't take care of it. Um, you can always add, like, um, round brackets to force precedence. All right, so now we start with the real programming stuff or more programming stuff. So if you are dealing with R, then R, when you start R, you get something which is called a session. And everything in R, um, which you load into your session, is in uh, RAM memory. So this, this is the random access memory, which is more or less, um, if you buy a computer, it tells you that you have 16 gigs of, of um, memory in there. Um, they mean random access memory. There's a lot more memory in your computer than just the 16 gigs, which is plugged into the main board. Um, but in R, everything goes in there. So if you are filling up a vector, um, so my computer has like 16 gigs, I think, or perhaps even a little bit more. But after 16 gigs, um, it will just say, I am out of memory. So be aware that that will happen when you start dealing with big data sets. But you can manage your session. Um, so something that we already saw is the set working directory command which will allow you to change your working directory or where you are on your hard drive you have the get working directory command to get the current working directory so when you start up r uh, you are generally in c users denny slash documents something like that um, but of course i always want to go somewhere else because i don't store all of my data there um, I store my data on my D drive or on my E drive or it's on a flash drive and then you have to just use the set working directory um, and this goes wrong a lot of the times a lot of the times many of these things are just like oh I can't read the table um, and then they are then people are in the wrong working directory that happens a lot all right so um, we can do a dir command and the dir command shows us the current files in the current directory um, so it will show us what's on your desktop or hey, imagine that you are on the C drive um, if you type there then it will show that there's a Windows folder there's a program files there's a users folder so the standard stuff uh, on a C drive in, in Windows in the session for R you have a, have a similar command which is ls so the ls command shows you currently which variables and functions are loaded into your R session so these are not files, these are variables which are defined. Um, so let's go back right to the, uh, to the R window. Um, we can do that quite quickly like this. Um, so here I can do a dir, right? So when I do a dir, I see that these are all of the, uh, all of the files that are in my current working directory where I have all, 
web where I did my lecture. And if I do an LS, I can see what's currently loaded in my in my um, in my session. So I have a variable called clusters. I have a variable called highly variable. I have a variable called microarray and so on. And you also see here scaled variation. Scaled variation is of course uh, the vector with the uh, variation numbers. So it, it, it shows you which um, um, which variables are there. Um, so of course if I would just type x then I would get error object x not found um, because of course there is no variable called x. Um, and sometimes this can help you debug stuff, right? If you get an error which says, oh, I cannot find this object, um, then you could just use the ls function to see if this object is actually loaded, or if you just made a typo, and you can compare this to, to the, the list, right? So if I would make an error and type micro array without a double r, then it would say, oh, this thing is not found, but then I could do an ls and figure out, no, it's actually called micro array with double r. So um, it helps. Um, we can install packages into R. Um, we did this for the preprocess core package. The preprocess core package actually does not come from the standard R repository. It comes from the uh, bioconductor repository. So the bioconductor repository is, is separate from the standard R repository. If you want to install stuff from the, s from the standard R repository, you can do that using the install.packages function. Uh, you give it the name of the package that you want to install using quotes um, because it, it expects a string and then you can load the package after it's installed by using library. Um, if you want to save an object, um, for example you loaded a big matrix of data and you want to save that um, as small as possible, um, then you can save an object as a binary file and this will also allow it to be loaded into R very quickly. Um, especially for the people who had not a very good computer um, and loading in the microarray data set took some time, right? If you don't have an SSD um, but an older hard drive, then loading in um, this microarray data set takes a little bit of time. Um, then you can actually save the microarray object. So you say save microarray, um, comma file is microarray.rdata, and then it will save a file to your hard drive called microarray.rdata and you can load that in using the load command. So when you then say load microarray.rdata and this thing will load in much quicker because it's only like one tenth of the size of the original text file. Um, so if you're working with big files then the save and load command can help you save a lot of time um, because this will save it in, in a binary format which R can just read. If you want to save all of the objects, which I would never advise you to do, but uh, imagine that you're working on in R and you've done, like you've defined variables and all of these things and all of a sudden you have to go and you don't know where the Windows um, the Windows update is already shouting, I will start my Windows update in like 10 minutes and hey you really need to go and you don't want everything to be lost. Uh, you can type, type save.image and then you just give it a name. Um, always name, name it with an rdata extension um, and this will save all of the variables. So it will just take your entire ls and go through each object in ls and save it into one big binary format. Um, if you want to quit, then you can use the Q function um, and then you can add the string no. Um, this will quit the R session without saving the current environment. I never save the current environment. Um, it is a source of many, many bugs. Um, if you close R, it also asks you, do you want to save your current like thing? No, you never want to save it. Um, because then the next time that you start up R, it will start loading in all the other variables that you already had. And when you are programming, you want to start with a clean environment, right? We want to have reproducible research. So something that you did yesterday should not affect the code that you are running currently. So never ever save your R session. Um, so if you quit, just type Q uh, with the word no in there with the, the air quotes um, and then this will this will just quit R not saving any of the of the stuff to the disk. Alright. Um, how long have we been talking? 53 minutes. Alright, so we will do a short break. Um, like I said, um, 
I will probably run a 60 second ad break and then uh, you guys can enjoy the uh, the old animated GIFs. Um, so um, I'm hoping that that uh, that that's not bad. I didn't have time. Um, I was talking to a couple of our PhD students the entire morning. Um, I was planning on on finding new GIFs for you guys to enjoy, but you just have to do it with the old GIFs from last week. Um, so I'm I'm sorry about that. I will stop the recording and then I will start the break and I will see you guys in like 10 minutes.